Hi everybody, Steve here, and um, uh, this looks a bit different to other lectures. I'm sort of uh, playing around with the format a little, so I've used a different um, text design. Uh, it's actually a bit easier to read, I think, but um, we'll just see, and we'll keep playing around with it. Uh, but that's sort of an aside to what we're talking about this week, which is the adaptation of Don't Look Now. So this is a Daphne du Maurier short story which was being which was adapted by Nicholas Rogue in um, sort of the early 1970s and uh, Daphne du Maurier you may have heard about she's probably more known for her adaptations actually Alfred Hitchcock really liked adapting her work so he adapted uh, Jamaica Jamaica in uh, Rebecca which won an Academy Award in 1940 and also The Birds is also adapted from a Daphne du Maurier short story. However, she hated The Birds, like really loathed The Birds, and she felt that Alfred Hitchcock had made nothing but sort of a, a sort of a schlock horror from her short story. And um, she sort of vowed never to work with um, Hitchcock again, will never allow him to adapt any of her work. And I, I guess that's the point of Don't Look Now. I think we should just preface this by saying if you read anything that this is a horror film, um, probably disregard that because this really isn't a horror. It has horror themes in it, but it's not really a horror film. And if, you know, if you're going to this film wanting to be scared, you're not going to be scared. Okay. So I just want to make that quite clear. This really isn't a horror. It's a horror theme. And that's what Daphne de Borea is really about. And I guess that's what becomes really interesting when you're adapting somebody like her. Who's really, she's really interested in these kind of gothic themes, but she's not so interested in genre and what actually happens when you adapt her work and try and place it or play it out um, through a particular genre. She really liked uh, Nicholas Rogue's adaptation of Don't Look Now, and I guess it's because he doesn't play it as genre. He plays it as something else. He plays it really as a, a couple relationship between this um, kind of married couple in turmoil. Right, now I just want to say a couple of things about adapting a short. Um, I mean, we've, we've sort of been looking at a, a lot of different sorts of adaptations so far, and sort of think about the innocence and sort of compare it to something like Don't Look Now. So The Innocence was a novella, which is about, what, 130 pages, I think. So this is this is a little bit shorter. Now, I just before we actually just get on to the specifics of this as a short, I just want to say a couple of things about the short. The short doesn't have the scope to do everything a novel can, right? And it has to imply a lot without explaining. And I actually think, like, when you're sort of thinking about horror films and horror, the really good horror films, a lot of them are actually based on short stories they're not actually based on novels and because that's the thing about the horror once you flesh out the idea of a horror often those really ambiguous things becomes kind of quite flat and you know can i dare i say a little bit corny so what's interesting about the short is the short kind of sets up these ideas and these themes and it's really about the reader actually interpreting them and taking them somewhere and i've always felt that the sort of the horror it actually does work better as a short story not that I'm saying Don't Look Now is a short. And actually, the thing about Daphne de Maurier's short is it's actually kind of been dismissed as something that isn't very good and that the, the film actually did something really fantastic with it. I actually don't agree. I mean, I was reading this uh, and, again, and I'm just, I just think it's a, a really remarkable short story. It's just so compelling. Anyway, what I think is really interesting about the, the film Don't Look Now as opposed to the short story is the short story implies a lot of backstory, right? It sort of implies that all these things have happened before we get to this moment. And that's the thing about the short story. The short story is really about being in a particular moment and it's a very tight moment where what the film does is it gives you that backstory. It gives you the death of the child. It shows you the death of the child. So it brings all these other th elements into it that you just don't get in the short story. And I think it's because the short story sets it all up. It's all there in the short story, but the film can actually go in and do something really interesting with it. Now, um, so the short story, De Morio's short, is about 55 pages which I suppose is a long short story when it comes to shorts. It's, it's kind of a long short story, but it is still only about half the length of a novella. So think of all the things that happen in The Innocence, in Henry James's novella, The Innocence, 
and what doesn't happen in this short story that it just can't happen in this short story. One of them being that Laura really doesn't have a point of view like she will have in the in the film. Uh, now, I reckon that the 55-page short is a pretty good length for a feature adaptation because it can tell its story in some detail and focus on the characters. Now, like, just think of, when you're reading the short, think of John. And all the time that the short sets with spends with John, it's not just John doing stuff. It's not just John moving from point A to point B. It's actually John just pondering and thinking, and we're spending some time with him doing that. If this short was, say, 20 pages, you wouldn't be able to do that, right? Wait till we get to Rear Window, and we've got a really, really short, short story. You really can't spend time really exploring the characters, but this short is actually able to do all of those things, and it really was, you know, it really informed Nicholas Rogue and his character, and what actually him and Donald Sullivan were able to do, certainly with the character of John. And you know, just a shorter length wouldn't have had this luxury. Now, um, this is kind of interesting. Uh, so, so, so these are two book covers, right? Of Don't Look Now. Of course, Don't Look Now is only a short story, so it was there was a lot of marketing going around this. It was basically, um, the book was uh, Daphne de Maurier's short stories, and Daphne de Maurier always wrote short stories about this length, about 55 pages. It was kind of interesting. Is she, was she actually sort of wanting adaptations, film adaptations, because it seems to work so well? But think how differently we read these two covers. One is just an illustration of... Um, you know, clearly a, a woman, and um, which is meant to be Laura, and sort of the, the two kind of weirdo um, sisters, right? And then the other one is actually an image from the film. It's a photograph of um, Julie Christie and Donald Sullivan from the film. Now think how differently we read a book cover from an adaptation when you've actually got an image from the movie. So what we've got from the, the one on the right with Donald Sullivan and Julie Christie is we've got actual celebrities that we can identify to this. So we're given an actual vision and an actual um, sort of uh, celebrity status, if you will, of these characters. And that is very different to what's going on in literature, where literature, it is about the literature actually giving you an idea of the characters. In adaptation, so adaptation is kind of secondary. So if you watch... Um, even if you haven't seen the film, but you pick up the cover with these stars on it, you're thinking of it as a movie, as a cinematic work, and your reading becomes as a cinematic work. And I think that is very different, and that's something we can talk about um, over the next couple of weeks. Now, uh, let's just talk through some of the modes that are clearly at work in this adaptation. So, it, it's a, imitation, I think, is clearly there. Imitation updates certain aspects of the source while refusing to change others. Now, Daphne de Maurier and Nicholas Rogue. So what we're talking about here is a female author being adapted by a male director, which is very different, like, say, um, um, sort of, you know, Paolo Alto, which is a female directing a male writer. So is there an issue with this? And would it have been more successful if a female had directed this movie? Now, that being said, I, I think this is almost a perfect movie as far as what it's doing. But would it have been a more interesting movie if a female had directed um, Daphne du Maurier's work or prose? What's kind of ironic about this movie is that the criticism for Rogue's movie is that he feminised Daphne du Maurier's work. Right, and what I mean, I mean, feminize is a bit ridiculous. It's like if you show two people in love and you have a love story, apparently that's being really feminized. Well, I don't really know why, but anyway, that's that's an aside to what we're talking about here. Now, um, so he was criticized for feminizing the story by making it a love story between a husband and wife, so sort of moving away from the horror elements of the story. What Rogue does here is he gives Laura a point of view. Right. She doesn't really have a point of view in the short story. So it's more it's a bit more male focused in the short story. Um, you know, and just to, just to think that you know, just because a female writes a story doesn't mean it's going to necessarily have a a, a central female character. Like it's not, you know, go, or if a male writes a story, it's not necessarily going to have a male central figure. There are things going on that we don't see in the story. Um, there's a great love scene 
which is considered one of the great love scenes of the history of film. You actually look at any, you know, the best love scenes in the history of movies, Don't Look Now is often up there because it is so, it's so natural and there's something so, um, so sort of kind of kind of caring about the two characters. I mean, you've got to think of when this love scene actually takes place in the movie. It takes place after uh, you know a certain amount of mourning the loss of their child, and it seems that they're getting their appetites back in many regards, and you know they're actually connecting with one another um, in ways that they hadn't been. And that's not in the short story; it's in the movie. So he's actually bringing these sort of a real sort of sensual element to their relationship. But what I really like about what Rogue is doing um, with Demario's work is he's keeping John and Laura at a distance from one another. And you get that in the book, but he's actually giving you good reason to do that. So in in the novel, they're both British, right? But in the film, you've got Donald Sullivan, an American, and Julie Christie, who's British. So you've got an American and a British person in a relationship. And there's, there's always just this kind of distance to them and that has to do also with nationality I think um, as much as anything else which is really interesting another criticism of the film is that Rogue has a sort of a kinder setting to Demoria I I don't know if I actually agree with that so I'll be interested to know what you have to say about that I mean do you agree this is a problem does it shift from its chiller element and I would actually say that the film is essentially at the core of this film it's a family melodrama because it's about a couple of people trying to mourn and get over, or if you can get over, the loss of their daughter. And that's really interesting. So it is imitation because it sort of, it just changes certain elements of the story, but it never, it doesn't refuse, it kind of refuses to change others. It doesn't, you know, want to sort of just rewrite the story, so to speak. It kind of wants to understand the story and really connect to the story. So it's an adjustment, absolutely. Adjustment is it changes and alters the source without losing the sentiment, right? So water becomes a stronger theme in the film. So in the in the story, you, you, you know, water is there. It is very important, but it is a central theme of the movie. So in the movie, Christine, their daughter, drowns, right? She doesn't die from meningitis, which is how she dies in the short story. Now, watching this gives us more empathy and sympathy with Laura and John because in the short story, right, Christine has died before the short story actually begins. So it's something is, you know, it's something that's already happened. We weren't there. We weren't part of it. But in the movie, because we're part of it, we have both empathy and sympathy because we're outside of their relationship, but we're also actually in their relationship because we've been watching their relationship. Um, with Laura and John. So we're we're kind of grieving with them and understanding what they're actually going through as a couple who have lost their child. And it's quite a a harrowing um, way to begin the movie. Um, I'm not really sure if there are many movies that can claim to be such a harrowing way. And the thing is, it's not gratuitous. It doesn't sort of keep going back to it. It's these people that are trying to actually move on with their lives like they are in the short story, but they're just finding it very hard to do that. But the thing about water and that Christine drowning is that water is sort of means it's sort of a tie to death. You can, if you see water, you think death in this movie. At another time, there's a body who is pulled out of the water in Venice. There's essentially a serial killer on the loose. This isn't really played up, all right? It's sort of mentioned and, you know, John and you know, Laura are clearly a little bit on edge because of this. But water is always connected to tragedy. And this is where the bodies are being washed up in Don't Look Now. In a way, and something you could say about the short story, um, which I, I guess it doesn't really matter because she dies from meningitis, but in the film, here is a daughter who dies from drowning, and where do they go to actually recover from the death of their daughter? Well, they go to Venice, which is kind of a, a you know a city, a floating city, which is surrounded by water. It seems a little bit ironic. So what Rogue does is he makes Venice part of John's job and he's there to restore an old church, right? So John has real purpose in Venice and also it means that they're not tourists in Venice, right? They're not seeing the sights. We're we're getting a different sort of Venice to the one that we normally get. We're getting one out of season. We're getting a Gothic Venice, which again is really, really 
interesting. And that is actually not something that's in the short. In the short, it is more in season than out of season. It's, uh, the film is very much a revision. The revisions seek to alter the meaning and spirit of the source. So think of the red coat. I mean, how can you not think of that red coat when you're watching this? Uh, now, the red coat doesn't have the same meaning in the story because in that opening sequence, Christine wears a prominent red coat, right? And then what happens is when John keeps seeing a little girl or a little figure wearing a very similar, almost identical red coat, the coat isn't identical, but the color of the coat is identical. He's connecting that directly to Christine. We're direct connecting that directly to Christine. He's been told that Christine is watching them. Is she still alive? And this is the thing, when people are mourning the death of someone, you know, they say that what often happens is the ghost element is very, very prominent shortly after the death of someone, right? Because it's very hard for people to actually let go and actually accept them not to be in their life. So the whole thing is, is John actually seeing the red coat? Is he seeing Christine? Is this actually an apparition or a hallucination again? And that's kind of really interesting. So in the short, all you've got is the girl in Venice wearing a red coat. But because Christine was wearing the red coat, you're directly connecting Christine to what he's seeing in Venice. So John isn't chasing a little girl, he's chasing a ghost. He's trying to save his daughter, essentially. You know, that's who he's trying to save. Also, um, Red has a, a greater connection with Venice. It's also associated with the city of Venice. Everyone's read the history of Venice. And um, it Red, of course, becomes the colour of death. And if you remember that image from the book um, that I was showing you, the book cover, there's actually, you know, red kind of, um, like a pool of red blood. So it's uh, it's celebration also, absolutely. They have a reluctance to change the exact words or sentiment of the source. I mean, things have been added, like I said, but the sentiment does stay the same. So it's a tale about images, framing and cutting as told by images, framing and cutting. So the story sees images, the film shows images, right? So think about that. It's a tale about images, framing and cutting, right? That's what Def Daphne de Morio is really interested in. But what Nicholas Rogue is interested, he's interested in showing you those images, the framing, the cutting, and think of the actual cutting and how what he's actually doing is past, present, and future are all mixed up together. They're all meshed together just through those quick shots. And it's really, really effectively done. Like, you know, there's that great love scene when in the middle of love, he's kind of cutting to like 20 minutes later when they're actually getting dressed just to go out. Um, which again is really interesting. During the drowning sequence, you know, he's cutting to Venice, he's cutting to later on. And we'll actually see why it's so important that past and present and, and future is sort of intermeshed because what actually happens at the end of the movie, that actually comes all sort of ahead, um, which I'll maybe explain after you've seen the film. The film is essentially interested in its sounds and images between the cutting of past, present and future. Now, the story is far more linear than the movie, I think, because, you know, what you're actually getting in the movie is a lot of cutting back and forth, like I was saying, but it doesn't actually get away from the short story by doing that, and that's that's really fascinating about it. It is very much celebrating, all right, the short story, but it's doing something very cinematic with the short story, and that's something to sort of um, take on when you're watching this uh, it's colonisation, absolutely. So this is a Nicholas Rogue film. If you know anything about Nicholas Rogue, or you don't know anything about Nicholas Rogue, uh, check out his films, kind of the films he was making in the 70s, like Walkabout, um, The Man Who Fell to Earth, uh, Performance. So The Man Who, Who Fell to Earth was with David Bowie. Performance was with Mick Jagger. And in all of these films, he's he does similar things with the cutting and the sounds, right? And that's kind of what you get here. So when you watch... Don't Look Now, it is very much a Nicholas Rogue movie. He's putting his fingerprints all over this movie and all over Daphne de Maurier's short story. Uh, the rapid shots infuse Venice with John's fear, it's sort of imprisoning the viewer behind bars and screens, and he likes doing that. He likes, he likes characters feeling like they have no control over their fate, and that's what you're getting in this short uh well this feature film as well frequently the camera is placed literally within venice's underworld positioned at obscure low angles as if he's being watched from below and there's that sort of gothic element to all of nicholas rogue's films death is a central 
theme of his movies and it's a central theme of this movie. Death has come to this couple and you feel that death will sort of rear its ugly head yet again. Um, Venice becomes more than a backdrop and location and Rogue is really interesting with interested with location. So we're out of season. It's the dead of winter. It's not a city surrounded by tourists. It's not Venice the pre-packaged work of art. It's not the Venice we normally see in most movies. If you think of something like The Tourist, you know, that terrible movie with um, Johnny Depp, which is out a couple of years ago, um, you know, that is the typical Venice that we get, that tourist kind of uh, sort of travelogue Venice, you know, the film that was called The Tourist, you know, is very much about that. And let's let's just look at how beautiful Venice actually is. This film isn't like that. Like, it's very beautiful, but it's not beautiful in that I want to be there, I want to go there. It's beautiful in that old, creepy, uncomfortable, gothic kind of way. So just a final thought uh, before we leave this. So Daphne de Maurier really liked the film, so she really liked the adaptation. Because, you know, what she said is, Rogue never went from the sentiment of the story. You know, what she set up was something really interesting. And I think that she's been uh, the story's been unfairly dealt with because it's sort of like, well, look what all the things that Rogue brought to it. Well, yeah, bro, Rogue, Rogue brought a lot to it because it was a short story and he had to do something with it. He had to flesh out the story. But it's all there in the story. And if you read the story, you will see how much of this story is actually on the film. It's just that Rogue has been able to think about that. The film is about fleshing out the motifs and themes from the story, and that's really what it's about. And the story about not being in charge of one's fate, and that is essentially the, the theme of the story, that fate comes to us all and we can't really control it. Um, the, the film is equally a celebration and adjustment for its both literary and cinematic. And what I mean by that is it just, just uh, to bring attention to how simply and poignant the short story actually is. When you read the short story and then you go and watch the film, you kind of want to go back and read that short story again because although he adds a lot to it, he's also really trying to get a sense and an understanding for the short story. He's also doing things cinematically that you just can't do in the short. Like, there's always this thing going on in a lot of the scenes where characters, sort of the secondary characters who aren't, actually involved in the, you know, sort of not um, John and Laura. And they're always sort of looking suspiciously at each other. They're always sort of looking suspiciously at John and Laura as if they're aware of something, as if John and Laura are basically pawns in a wider conspiracy. And it's really, really effective and it's really interesting. You can't get that in the short because you don't have the scope to do it, and how do you actually write that? But you can do it really effectively in the feature film. So he's kind of always doing things like that to it, and I think it's a really, really remarkable um, adaptation. So we'll leave it there. Uh, I hope you enjoy this uh, this film. I think it's a really great piece of work, and it's, it's quite riveting. It's sort of a film that you really need to watch more than once, um, but the fact that we get to watch it on the big screen and on this great Blu-ray print that I have is um, is really fantastic. All right, so I hope you enjoy reading Daphne de Morio's short work. I do recommend you read other works that she's written. Um, Rebecca, which is her novel, is you know really fantastic as well. All right, I'll leave it there, and I will see you at the screening.